Good morning, everybody. How are you? See, Paul, don't I have a really good looking class? Great looking class. Don't they look intelligent? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can always say that a class takes on the reflection of its teacher, and these people look brilliant. <laughs> It is good to see everybody here today. Um, Paul and I, in discussing aftermath of the election, were thinking, what are we going to do? We had scheduled to have Dr. Paul Jaley here this weekend, many, many weeks ago. So, uh, and you're going to enjoy Dr. Jaley. If you've never heard, some of you, many of you have heard him. Uh, he spoke to a group of us pastors and leaders Friday here at the church and just did a marvelous job. And so you're going to enjoy him later today. But uh, we scheduled him to be here, and he'll be speaking this morning in the service. And so we got to thinking, well, we probably need to visit with our congregation in the aftermath of the election, if that's what you want to call it. And, um, and we thought, well, the best way to do that then, since Dr. Jaley is going to be here, and we don't want to preempt him, obviously, that we would just take the class and turn it down a different road for today. We'll go back to angels next week, okay? Uh, we have a fallen angel here on stage with us today. So, so it's still angels. It's still angels. And I mean, and notice which side he's seated on, the left. So, I, uh, we set everything up perfectly. It's just... <laughs> so anyway... Anyway, we thought it would be good if Paul and I didn't try to teach a lesson, but that we just talked between he and I and you. And uh, because we, we've been on the phone, obviously, a lot this Almost week. Almost like the conversation that we've been having. That's only exactly we're right. Them in it. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so we thought that we would just have a conversation, and maybe you would want to hear what we're thinking, what we're feeling, because I'll bet it's a lot like you. And some, some uh, other thoughts that we thought we would want to discuss with you. So we want to do that. Uh, it's, this is very informal. We don't have a script. There are three categories that I would like to cover today uh, if, if we can make the clock work with us. One would be our thoughts on the election in and of itself as an election. The, the second would be how does this, if at all, fit into what we perceive as the Bible's teaching on end times, does this have any uh, uh, impact on that? Is, is this a part of that? But then third and most importantly, I believe, what do we do now? Which I think is the most important question to answer of all three. So let's begin with prayer, and then we're just going to have a conversation with you included and if there's something that you want to ask as we're going along or add as orderly as we can do it, I want you to feel the freedom to do that because this is a very informal kind of thing. This is, this is not a lecture, but uh, Paul and I obviously have been spending a lot of time talking with not only each other, but with other guys that we perceive to be leaders in, in this area. And uh, so we thought we'd want to make you privy to that conversation. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Let's pray first, and then we'll get going. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for loving us. What a great and mighty God you are. We thank you, Lord, that as we all know, and as we've said many, many times, the Godhead never meets in emergency session. There's never panic in heaven. Now, Lord, because we often panic, that probably doesn't say as much about our faith that we would want it to say as it actually does. But Lord, we, we are facing some very um, confusing, difficult, um, uh, concerning times. And Father, we want, to be, uh, we want to be who you want us to be. We want to be faithful to you. And so I pray that you would be with us this morning as we just casually visit and talk about who we are and what does all of this mean. So we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, John MacArthur has been doing a conference for years and years out there at Grace Community called the Shepherds Conference. 
And I have watched numerous YouTube videos of that Shepherds Conference. I've never been able to attend personally, more than likely just because I didn't make it a high enough priority. But with YouTube and all, you can pretty much be there. And one of the things that they do at the close of the Shepherds Conference is they always get their, their primary teachers of the conference up on a stage. Typically, there'll be five or six including MacArthur, and they just do kind of a, a, a round table discussion with questions thrown out by a moderator. Now, we kind of have our own questions here today that we want to deal with, but we also want you to be able to interact as well uh, if, if you, you really feel led. So we're going to try to respect the clock enough to give you some opportunity to do that as well. So let's begin by talking about some general observations of what happened on Tuesday and what's been going on ever since, just in the political sense alone. So, Paul, do you want to kind of begin that part of it, and then uh, we can just kind of chime in on both of us just back and forth? Sure. I think all of us kind of expected that we would see what we saw, but I think we're all shocked to have actually seen it. Yeah. You know, this has been talked about for several years. Uh, we know that in 2016, and of course some of this will tie over when we talk about prophetic implications, we know that things were uh, progressing nicely as we had a president that was elected in 2008 that traveled the world and apologizing for America and American influence. We uh, implemented critical race theory teaching in every area of our government. And now it's all policy with uh, corporations. Of course, yeah. it's been in uh, colleges for, for decades, but now it's been brought into uh, uh, high schools. We've created this um, atmosphere that we have. Uh, everything was progressing nicely, taking down the sovereignty of America so that we, and uh, wanting to lower our standard of living uh -huh. and uh, raise the others around the world so that we could easily more integrate. And of course, we know that they talk, Obama talked about, oh, those jobs are never coming back and you know, our, our energy prices must necessarily skyrocket and all yeah. those things. Uh, when using the uh, climate change fiasco and everything else, trying to, <clears throat> to cause that to come about. Um, we know that um, back in 2018, you'd seen men like George Soros talking about the problem we'll be taking care of in 2020 and, yeah. uh, and all of that. You know, 2016, I think, caught them all by surprise. I think they just assumed that Hillary was going to roll right in. I don't think they really believed any of the polls that went against what their polls were saying, and I think they were caught flat-footed uh, to some degree in 2016. And they have made a commitment to not let that happen again. And I'm absolutely convinced as I'm watching the, you know, I, I look at everything, look at all the surveys, and then trust your eyes. You know, remember, what's that old yeah. Groucho Marx uh, uh, statement? Are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you watch these rallies around the country and you see 57,000 gather in Pennsylvania for Trump and you see fives and tens gathering for Biden Harris and even Obama as he's yeah. traveling around on their behalf. You see, you know, Biden get out there and, and literally talk about well-organized election fraud in one yeah. of his public statements, yeah. uh, talks about we're gonna not get, we're gonna you know, eliminate fracking, you know, and all of these things that should just cause the country to leave him in droves. Uh, and then what's amazing, yeah, they did. And then the whole thought of us being American citizens and voting out of office a man whose platform, uh, we voted into office apparently, uh, a 48 year politician who went into politics broke and is now worth, you know what, $50 million. We're voting out of office a guy that went into politics uh, four years ago and is leaving office with less money than when he came in. And we're voting out of office a guy, we're American citizens and we're voting out of office a guy whose platform is make America great again. Yeah. I just find that yeah. not only hard to believe, I find it impossible to believe. And there's a lot of evidence out there yeah, there's that a ton. says this thing has been stolen. Yeah. Well, I, I think we all saw it. I think we watched Tuesday night at uh, a, I believe, a pre-chosen time. Mm -hmm. At least five of the swing states shut their counting down mm -hmm. all at about the same time, almost as if it was synchronized and a strategy. Typically, if it looks like a duck, it probably is a duck. Right. And, and I think that what we saw was a plan that was hatched years ago. If you remember the media after the Hillary loss and other operatives said, we will not let this happen again. And they immediately went to work 
to make sure that it wouldn't happen again. And so Shazam, you go to bed with Trump, 500,000, 700,000 votes up in Pennsylvania. You wake up and he's down to a little over 100,000. What happened overnight? And then after the election is, is over, officially on Tuesday, they start getting these uh, great dumps of mm -hmm. ballots. And amazingly, practically all, all of, of them, them are Biden mm -hmm. and none are Trump. And if there are any for Trump, it's such a minuscule number that it doesn't line up with the typical percentage of, of the way the votes were breaking across the state. It's just, it's utterly ridiculous. We all know it. Uh, and so I, I think what we saw was an orchestrated coup mm -hmm. through a political process that if it is not corrected, probably spells the end of free and fair elections as we've known them, mm -hmm. because now you've got some runoffs in Georgia for Senate seats. They can cheat just as easily there in mm -hmm. the Senate races as they can with the presidential. And so if we don't do something pretty quickly, I think it's going to greatly undermine Americans' confidence in the republic itself. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what we have going, Brian. Right. I can say with about 99% confidence this, the Democrats thought it was a coup. Right. This was actually a setup. Yeah. Obama's been planning this since actually before 2016. He knew exactly how they were going to cheat. And, he put, and he's been working about the past at least two years since, every, since he created the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and so one of the things that, that we wanted to say is we've, we've heard the stories. Uh, Infowars, of course, interviewed a gentleman who does not work for the government, but he was probably one of the first ones to break this publicly. And, I, you know, I've told people, they've asked me about it. I've said, well, we can only hope and pray that that story is true. Mm -hmm. my, my concern was, and Brian is helping to bring a little bit of confidence to me. My, my concern was is that so much stuff on the internet is fake. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously that guy wasn't fake, but he could be completely lying. Of course, what motive would he have? Because it would ruin his reputation. He'll be worthless if that was just a total fabrication. So our hope is that the story of a sting operation that was put together by the Trump administration uh, almost two years ago, anticipating what the Democrats were going to do is true. And it is a very technical operation if what is being said is true. I'm only saying if, not because I don't believe Brian. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to be careful yeah. Yeah. because our credibility is on the line as well. And as pastors, one of the things that we can't do, and again, this is not a refutation of what Brian just said, so don't misunderstand. We have to be very, very careful because if we go off and say something that turns out to be a total fraud, then people will start to say, well, I don't know whether I can believe Dan or Paul mm -hmm. on other things either. And so we have to be a little bit careful. There are some things we can be dogmatic about, scripture and those kinds of things. So our hope is that it isn't a coup. Uh, I, our hope is that it was an attempted coup that's going to be thwarted by probably the largest sting operation that has ever been carried out in American history. That is our hope. That is my prayer. Because I can tell you, if you're just sitting and waiting on the courts to sift through this, uh, have fun. Because they, I don't think they can or will. The way they've done these mail-in ballots and separating the ballots as quickly as they could from the envelopes, uh, shutting out observers. I mean, the, the, the judge was overturned by a higher court, but one judge told them that they could get within 100 feet. And they said, well, we can't see anything. And he said, we'll get you some binoculars. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that's a judge saying stuff like that. Now, he was overruled. And thank God somebody had the sense to do that. But my point is, if we're waiting on the courts being able to go through and, and straighten all this out, more than likely the courts won't. They probably could. But if we're just waiting on the courts, my fear is they won't. Because typically, you just have enough strategically placed judges and justices 
that they'll just grow weak in the knees. I mean, look at what happens when John Roberts has the ability to kill Obamacare with one fell swoop mm -hmm. and instead makes up stuff out of thin air. Mm -hmm. So it's a concern to me. Uh, Amy Coney Barrett is now on the Supreme Court. That would help. But still, you know, there's only so many things a court can do. If they've destroyed the evidence, even if the court suspects there was foul play, if there's no evidence, the court cannot rule out of thin air. At least they're not supposed to. So, so for, for us, mm -hmm. let me kind of summarize this section so we can move on to the next. We believe that there was a free and fair election up until the time those five or so states stopped counting mm -hmm. on Tuesday night. At that point, the fix was in, and by the morning, everything had changed. Trump is now no longer trending as a leader. He's falling behind. And then, of course, surprise, surprise, they just keep uncovering hundreds of thousands of votes for Biden, almost zero for Trump. One other thing I will say that some of you are probably aware of is this uh, uh, Air Force commander who was like third in charge. Mm -hmm. Uh, who says that there is a software program that was actually invented to infiltrate the terrorists. Mm -hmm. It's called Hammer, is the name of the software program that was utilized by the Democrats. And basically what it does is somewhere in the electoral process, it kind of kicks in and begins to flip votes mm -hmm. and can 3%. flip it 3, 3 to 5%. Mm -hmm. And in close races, that's all you need. They were going to use it in the Hillary Trump election, but something that the commander said he was not at liberty to say stopped it the, the previous time. Now, again, this is a guy who was third in command of the Air Force. So he comes with a great deal of credibility, and typically those guys won't put themselves out there to tell just a blatant lie. So kind of wrap it up all in. I think Paul's right. Uh, they had everything going the way they wanted with Obama. S Hillary's the next step. Trump steps in thwarts their plans. They're so angry. They're never going to let this happen again. They cheated and we've watched it with our own eyes. And now our prayer is, and I think we need to pray is that the truth will, will, will come out, mm -hmm. that the truth will, will arise. So that's kind of where we are. We believe that this has been stolen, but you know, unless there's forces greater than us, they might be able to pull it off. I mean, Hillary's pulled off a whole lot of stuff. So there's where we are there. Okay, now let's go, Paul, quickly. Let's use about 10 minutes, okay. and let's talk about what, how do we see this fitting into Scripture, or do we, um, and let me, let me add this caveat before you take off, because you and I have visited, mm -hmm. so I know where you are and where you're going. Um, it is always a scary thing for a pastor, especially one who believes that most of the prophecy in Scripture is not fulfilled yet who's a premillennialist. I am, Paul is. We're dispensationalists. I know there are other orthodox views, and I'm not saying that you're not a Christian if you hold a different view, but that's what we are. And we think that we have an obligation to tell you where we stand on biblical issues as important as eschatology. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, there's always been a, a, a pitfall to premillennialists, and that is we're always looking for something to fulfill a prophecy. And I think in times past, maybe well-intentioned spokesmen have claimed that is this, and it turned out that was not this. And again, the credibility issue becomes uh, important. Hal Lindsey, for instance, used to make all kinds of outlandish claims about current events and would put them into the book of Revelation and say, well, what just happened the other day is this. Then it turns out not to be true. John Hagee, the four blood moons and all this kind of stuff. And so, uh, once again, credibility is, is critical, even in the area of eschatology. So, it's, it's always a scary thing to try to take what's happening now and try to put it into Scripture. Now, having said that, we've got a brain and we've got a Bible. So, Paul, can you kind of start us down this road? You and I have talked. Mm -hmm. Could this fit into Bible prophecy so tell well, me how you think I it think, might. I think we ought to be aware of what we are seeing. And I agree with you wholeheartedly, everything you just said. But if you remember, one of the things that Jesus chastised his generation <laughs> yeah. for was not recognizing the fulfilled prophecies pertaining yeah. to his first Couldn't coming. Couldn't see the signs. You can tell what the weather's going to be like. Can't you recognize the signs of the times? <laughs> we know that ultimately the last days began at Pentecost. 
Yeah. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. Now we're yeah. 2,000 years later into the last days. We also know that the church age, as hard as too many denominations try to look for it, the church age is hidden in the Old Testament. Yeah. And we know that all of the prophecies pertaining to the second coming are just that. The rapture is going to be seven years prior to the second coming. Yep. That is when that 70th week of Daniel timetable kicks in after the That's rapture. Right. But we know from Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 9 and Revelation 12, 13, 17, we know that there's a lot told to us that in this last period, just before Jesus literally comes and establishes an earthly kingdom for a thousand years, what the Jews call the age of the Messiah, we call the millennial reign of Christ, we do know that there is going to be a conspiracy, a global conspiracy exactly trying to right. establish global government. Daniel 2 identifies it as ten horns. Those horns are identified as ten kings. And I've noted before, as I've preached many times, I I find it interesting that although a lot of uh, uh, theologians call that the revived Roman Empire, it actually uses the term king and not kingdom. And I kind of believe that there's a particular reason that, that, that that's done. I think it's ten men. I think it's ten George Soros, Bill Gates. I don't know whether those are two of them. They may not be. Ten Joros, Soros, Bill Gates type of Jeff men. Jeff Bezos. Jeff Be that want to control the world. And, uh, you know, I don't know what it is about man. From Nimrod on, man has always had a desire to run the world. I just want to go play golf and go home and kick <laughs> a snake. But, you know, sinful mankind wants to run the world. <laughs> yeah. Want to run the world. Okay. I just want you to know that's idolatry. Yeah. I just want you to know. <laughs> Well, what, and, and what have we seen? You know, if you've done any kind of research, most of you all are probably up with some of this. But since 2016, again, we were integrating America into globalism very quickly. Obama travels the world apologizing. You know, uh, no, it, this is, uh, it's not a surprise. Obama's Paris a Accords, Marxist. Paris His Accords, all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, Paris Accords, all the, everything trying to integrate America into globalism. And then un, nobody saw coming Mr. Make America Great Again. Boy, that just disrupted everything. Breaking us out of the Paris Accord renegotiating trade deals, America's energy independent, wanting to build up borders, America be a great world leader well, again. Well, and Great Britain breaking away Break, from the great EU. Great Britain breaking that's away a, from... That's, yeah, a, that's a wonderful ab absolutely, kind of thing. Absolutely. But you see, we know that in the last days that these ten are going to come to power. Uh, Daniel 7 tells us that there's going to be another, not one of the ten, but another little or lesser horn with eyes to see and a mouth to speak, great wonders, blaspheming God. So he's going to be a super. Don't think of him as somebody that shows up like the devil. No. He's going to no. be a super politician. Yeah, he'll be I, a JFK type. I said years ago he'd be yeah. like a Barack Obama. Well, and I'm yeah, not saying yeah. it is Barack Obama, but now that I'm looking at it, it could be. No, I understand. He was everything yeah. to everybody. He was a Muslim. He was a Christian. He was black. He was white. He was uh, for <laughs> same-sex marriage. He was opposed to same-sex marriage. Yeah. He was just whatever you wanted him to be. And Scripture says that they will put him out as their spokesperson. He's going to become too big for his britches, and he will become what the Scripture says, Rav, the chief head yep. of the group. Yep. Three of those ten are going to say, no, we, this is not what we hired you for, and try to suppress him. They're going to be uprooted, and that's when he is going to come to power over that last yep. three and a half years. And, so and we, and we, you know, seems we, like we're getting close. Yeah, we all called him the Antichrist or the mm -hmm. Beast. And, mm -hmm. of course, there have been many antichrists, mm -hmm. John tells us. Anybody who's against Christ is antichrist. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. Mm -hmm. But there have been times in history where it looks like the devil has thought maybe this is the moment. Mm -hmm. So he trots his guy out there, and God says, no, nah, ain't time. So that guy goes down, even yeah. though he would have been the perfect antichrist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the devil's got to have somebody ready all the time. All he the time, because he time. doesn't know. Yeah. He doesn't know God's time. He can read God's Bible. He can read God's book, but he doesn't know when. He doesn't have the calendar. He doesn't have access to that. Uh, here's the way I always answer these questions. Exactly what Paul's saying, all the details of understanding prophecy, understanding, in my opinion, Daniel 9 is the master key to mm -hmm. understanding all of Bible prophecy. If you understand Daniel chapter 9, that's the key that will unlock all the other prophecies to you. To me, the book of Revelation is almost impossible to understand if you don't understand Daniel 9 properly. It is so, impossible. So it's the master key. In fact, I've always, in series that I've taught on the book of Daniel, when we get to chapter 9, I always call that chapter the master key to Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what it is. But here's the way that I look at it beyond the details. When Jesus was giving his discourse on, on Mount Olivet, and the disciples ask him a couple of questions. They're actually different questions. Right. A lot of 
modern theologians blend them into one question and then they believe that one answer suffices for one question. The problem is there's two questions and they're about two different things and Jesus proceeds to give two answers. One that is dealing with a fulfillment very near to them and one I believe dealing with a fulfillment very distant from them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he talks about all of these wars and rumors of wars and all this kind of stuff. And then he tells us that these things have always been going on, but they're going to happen right before the period that is so bad that he said it is the tribulation, the great one. And had God not shortened the period of time that it will take place, no flesh would survive, i.e. the seven years coming out of Daniel 9 and all of that. So here's what I've always said. Know the facts. But watch the lines, because as the lines all begin to converge, see, we've always had wars and rumors of wars, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've always had famine, pestilence, and all these kind of things. Any one of those by themselves may not necessarily be an end time sign, but when you see all of them begin to converge, all of the lines begin to converge, and you find this intersection point. When, when I was teaching math, one of the things that you're trying to find sometimes in graph work is the intersecting lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you find these lines intersecting, now you're beginning to see something. And I cannot believe personally that we're not living in the last of the last days. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the caveat, though, that we have to be very careful with. And this is, this is where I trip up if I'm not careful. Peter tells us that time is irrelevant with God. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't work on a timetable. Scripture's filled with times and God doing certain things at a certain time. But Peter tells us that a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day, meaning God doesn't have to hurry. God never says, whoo, boy, we better get busy. We're running out of time. <laughs> or, or God never says we're late. Or, hey, let's, the Godhead here, let's kind of get out ahead for once. Let's, let's get there early. I mean, it's none of that stuff. God is never late and he's never in a hurry. He's always on time. Okay? So we know that. So we have to be careful about, well, the, the rapture is going to happen in my lifetime. Well, what is my lifetime? 80, 85 years, 70? Adrian Rogers, one of my heroes of faith, it was 74. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what my time here is on this, this earth. The Lord may not be going to return for 150 years. And you say, oh my gosh, that's a long time. Really? I mean, we have some, somewhere around 6,000 years of human history from the recorded written history about 6,000 years. So 150 years is a long time. Well, it might be a long time to me, but it's not a long time in the overall scale. Now, I'm not saying it's 150 years till the Lord comes back. I think we're probably much closer than that. So what I think we have to look for is the converging lines. And it appears to me that the earth is ripe mm -hmm. for these 10 kings mm -hmm. to come together, this whole global thing. And eventually it has to happen because the Bible's prophesied that it will. Now, here's the thing. God can always hit the stopwatch. Anytime he wants, he can hit the stopwatch. For instance, God tells Nineveh in 40 days, you're toast. Mm -hmm. Now, in 40 days, they weren't toast. So was God lying? Was God baiting them? No. God was speaking a truth that was conditional based upon their response. Mm -hmm. Jonah delivers in 40 days, you're toast. He didn't want to deliver it. We know the story mm -hmm. that gets him there. He delivers it, then goes up on the hill so he can see all the fireworks. But Nineveh does something Jonah feared and no one expected. They repent. So what does God do? He hits the pause button. And the judgment doesn't come for over 100 years. But you read in the book of Nahum that the judgment God predicted did finally come. It came. It just came a little later because they repented. Mm -hmm. Remember the, the, the Jewish king, Hezekiah. Mm -hmm. God tells him, you're dead. Get your affairs in order. And he turns his face toward the wall and says, Lord, please. And God says, okay, I'll give you 15 more years. Now, in the midst of that... A horrible baby is born <laughs> who becomes one of the worst kings Israel ever had. So I'm not so sure that that extra 15 years was a plus. Uh, my point is, I don't know the actual time, but it certainly appears to me that what we're seeing happen on a global basis is exactly the setup given 
the providential hand of God and how God works and how he might interrupt and do things that we cannot explain. George Washington and the Continental Army should have been finished at the Battle of Long Island, New York. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were soundly beaten and were up on Harlem, what they called Harlem Heights, waiting for the knockout blow that did not come. And that night, late, Washington called his staff together and said, we're out of here. And they said, there's no way. We got to cross that river. We're dead men. Sun comes up, they catch us there, fish in a barrel, we're done. But we all, if you know the history, know that a fog blew in, a mysterious fog blew in and stuck around way beyond what the fog normally would, gave them cover, and they got out of there alive. Not only that, but they had to cross a number of other rivers in their retreat uh, uh, course, and floods happened upstream and just as the American army would cross the river, the floodwaters would get there and the British would have to wait another day or two. Well, that gave Washington and the army a little more time to get away. It happened two or three times, the floodwater kind of thing. Now, what is that? Well, I don't think it's divine destiny, but I do believe it's divine providence. Mm -hmm. They were trying to obey God and God acted accordingly. So who knows what's going to happen, but I do believe that we're kind of seeing prophecy set up for us if mm -hmm if we didn't already know that. Now, for the last 15 minutes, Paul, I know I'm cutting us here, but mm -hmm. I want to give us time. Let's talk about what I think is the most important thing for us immediately, and that is, what do we do now? Because that's what a lot of us are sitting here thinking this morning. What do we do? We did everything we could do here in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And it looks like Pennsylvania is going to steal it away, not only from Trump, but from all the other states, mm -hmm. just with their cheating there. So let's talk about now, Paul. I'll be Where very, very brief. A couple of things. One I've touched on yesterday in a funeral I did. You know, we have to do all that we can do, be in the middle of God's will, be obedient, just as the Apostle Paul was. And as he was in that Philippian prison, he was able to write that letter and talk about rejoicing in the Lord and having a peace that surpasses all human understanding. The peace you have is submission to God's will being done. Yeah. All you can do is the very yeah. best you can do. True. You fight hard, do everything the right way, work as hard as you can, be right in the middle of God's will, and then trust God for the results. That's peace. You know, Paul had peace that God was going to deliver him or not. And, he, and one day, Paul didn't, or God didn't. And one day, Paul lost his head, but he had that peace that the whole time. So recognize that. Second thing is, I, I want to remember that, and we've had this conversation with my son, Joshua. I have a tendency of, of falling back on a Norman Rockwell America. And the reality <laughs> is, we, we have lived in a period of time of the greatest blessings, really the last 40, 50 years, especially since Reagan, to be honest with you. We have had a really cushy life, especially as Christians. You know, and I say so often in, in our lectures around the country. You know, the thing that's unique about the United States is we're the only Christians in 2,000 years of Christian history that haven't been persecuted for our faith. You know, we have been very privileged and very special. So, you know, right now things may become a little tougher for Christians. That may be good for us. It may be our turn just to step up and be ready for it. But the second thing too is look at the history of America. You know, we were birthed out of a war on our own soil. Uh, within 30 years, we had another war where our capital, uh, the, the White House, was yeah, burned to the ground. exactly right. You know, just shortly after that, we had a war where people weren't just fighting it out on Twitter. We were actually shooting at each other. Yeah. We had a Great Depression that rocked the country. We had two world wars. We had communists infiltrate the government at a time coming out of World War II where we were the world power and everything was just wonderful and betrayed our country, sold nuclear secrets to the Soviet Union, and then we were in the midst of the Cold War and everything else. So if you think about it, over the 240 years of history, it really, it's generally, it, it, it hasn't always been easy. In fact, very few times has it been easy. That's exactly right. So for us to be going into a period of time where we may be facing some adversity, really, we should just be prepared for it. Uh, I am disappointed, I admit, because I, I was anticipating what could be over these next four years based upon the foundation had been laid. But I also made this note, and I'll, I'll shut up, and we can uh, do some practical things. No. Um, you know, I, I thought about it yesterday as I was, I think I was, I was driving to the funeral. Of course, just things keep rolling around my mind. You know, God had there's established. There's a lot of room in there. There's a lot of room. just bounces around like BBs in a shoebox. Uh, but, 
you know, God had established <laughs> his form of government for his nation, which was a constitutional republic. Yeah. Sure. They were free. They had 12 states. Yep. They weren't governed by a monarchy or a king. They were governed by law. They were to choose out yep. from among themselves capable men that feared God, loved truth, and hated covetousness. And everybody had equity under the law, and they were ruled according to the law. They had this great freedom. It's amazing. 400 years of going through this, revivals, and, and then uh, you know, turning from God and chastisement and revivals, 400 years of doing this, and then they got to a point where they said, eh, we just want, it. We, we, want it. we want big government to take care of us. We want a king. Yeah. We want a king just like everybody else. And God through Samuel said, Don't, you're, you're not going to like that. It's not a good idea. Trust me. What does that mean? Do what I've told you to do. Do it my way. Trust that I know what I'm doing. You'll be a lot better off. And they said, no, 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 no. We, we want a king. And, of course, we know from Saul <laughs> to David and Solomon and what happened thereafter. Yeah. But look at us. It's, it's, it's interesting that we have Paul Jaley with us this weekend because this is the 400th anniversary of the landing of the pilgrims at Plymouth Rock. And the Mayflower Compact, that first constitution that was ever drafted between equals, where nobody, there was no divine authority over anybody. We we're just a bunch of equals. Well, how are we going to govern ourselves? Well, let's constitute a limited government, yeah. and we'll pledge to be governed by this government of our creating. Wow, it was all birthed right there in 1620. Here we are 400 years later. I don't think we voted it away, but I think we may, we may be in the process of having it stolen yeah. away via yeah. election. We always tend to read the Bible in our context. Mm -hmm. That's just a natural kind of thing. We all do it. When Jesus says, don't be anxious about anything, and don't be anxious about tomorrow, sufficient for today are the challenges. Mm -hmm. Now, we read that on Monday morning in our context, right? And, there, and, and I think that's okay. God wants us to take his word and put it into our context. Put it back in their context. What kind of a world were they facing? He's about to send those disciples out and he's already told them, look, they hated me, they're going to hate you. Mm -hmm. He's already told them all that they're all going to basically die as martyrs. He's already told Peter, when you're an old man, they're going to they're martyr you. The only one that he gave a promise to that he wouldn't be martyred was John. Peter was very concerned about that. And Jesus says, uh, Peter, you take care of Peter, I'll take care of John. How's Amen. that? Um, he tells them that the temple is going to be destroyed. Not one stone is going to left, be left upon the, the, uh, another. Uh, we all know that happened in 70 AD. That's not that many decades forward. The church is going to be birthed. You know what happened to the early church. Persecution in every direction. All of its leaders are jailed at one time or another. Many of them meet martyrdom, including Paul. <laughs> that Paul, not this Paul. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I thought I was being hit again. Well, I'm, I'm going to take care of that just, martyrdom part for you. I'm just covering up in the corner. No, 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 no. no. So, so here's the thing. In that context, with what Jesus knows is about to happen to the guys, he says, don't worry. Don't worry. Now, our situation's not that bad. Now, we don't like what just happened on Tuesday through yesterday. But compare it to the context of the people he was talking to when he said that. Compare it to the context of Christians through the centuries who have been treated horribly. Read about them in Hebrews 11. Read about how the world was not worthy of them, and yet they lived in caves, destitute, mm -hmm. martyred. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know this. I found this out in life. Typically, things are never as good as you thought they were going to be, and they're also never as bad as you feared they would be. I believe that Christ is sufficient to get us through whatever it is we're going to face. Paul is writing from prison when he says, I can do all things mm -hmm. through Christ who is my strength. Now see, that's easy enough to quote on Tuesday when everything's kind of rocking along pretty good and I've got a great lunch plan today with some friends and I'm doing pretty good financially. I'm not as wealthy as I wish I was, but I'm doing pretty good. I can do all things through Christ. Now flip the context and put yourself in prison. Mm -hmm. I can do all things through Christ. Mm -hmm. Context means everything. Mm -hmm. So we can do all things. Guys, I'm as disappointed as you are. I'm as shocked as you are. But remember, God's kingdom does not revolve around our republic. Mm -hmm. I love our republic. Mm -hmm. I would fight and die for this republic. 
But his plan does not revolve around our republic. Republics historically are very fragile and have a very short shelf life. I hope that I'm not seeing the death of our republic. It could be, though, that I've already seen it and didn't want to accept it. Mm -hmm. Our republic may have died a few decades ago. Mm -hmm. And we're just now seeing the death throes of it. But always remember, and I must remind myself, God's kingdom does not revolve around our republic. Mm -hmm. I believe it was birthed properly, but guys, we're not proper now. Mm -hmm. Most churches won't touch issues. They're compromising in areas where we used to believe the Bible was just black and white. And now you've got the Southern Baptist Convention hedging on LGBTQ and all that. Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, you've got all of this going on. Most churches will not even have guys like Paul and me to speak in their churches. I'll drive past 100 churches to get to some little old bitty church that'll let me do black robe. Mm -hmm. But those others that I went by, even if they knew about it, probably wouldn't have it. The church is decadent. We are spoiled. We're brats. To be quite honest with you, if this thing doesn't turn around and this isn't a sting operation that works out to our favor, we deserve whatever we get, just to be quite frank with you. Now, I don't like it. I'm squeamish to pain. I don't want any. I can tell you that right now. But from what I see happening in the church of Jesus Christ in America, we deserve it. I hope we don't get it. I hope we get mercy. I'm praying for mercy. I'm praying for a great awakening. Paul's always talking about, man, I'm praying for a third great awakening. And so am I. But friends, we may not see that. So what do we do? Well, we be faithful. We be faithful. There's some practical things I think all of us can do. We need to kind of get our affairs in order. That's always a necessity. But, but certainly more now than ever, I think you need to have a little bit of food put back probably for 30 days. I'm not much of a prepper. I don't know how that would pan out, you know, to save up food for six or 12 months. I, I don't know if it got that bad, would we stay in one place? I'm not sure. We might become pretty mobile. Um, you need to prepare because if this is a sting operation and this is flipped, you just think you saw cities go up in smoke. It's going to go nuts. So supply lines could be shut down for a while, not because the bad guys are in charge. It's just so much chaos. I think you need to store up some fuel. Now, gasoline will not store for long periods of time unless you put stabilizer in it. I'm not suggesting you go buy 55-gallon drums of it and store it everywhere. First of all, that's illegal. You have to have special license to store that much. But you ought to store up some fuel. You need to keep all your cars full all of the time. You need to have necessities where you could make it. You might not live on T-bone steak, but you could make it. Uh, as we saw with the COVID thing, better have plenty of toilet paper. I'm just telling you right now, plenty of that. Because uh, apparently that's the first thing people go for. They'll go past the milk, the butter, the cheese, and the steaks, it really, the toilet it, paper. It's just good emergency planning. It is. It just, we just went yeah. through a week without power. Imagine you didn't yeah, have access exactly. to grocery exactly. store, your, your ATM machine. Just as much as you can afford without going nuts, because mm -hmm. you don't want to be a walking bank, mm -hmm. have some cash on hand. Mm -hmm. uh, put it away somewhere, number one, where if your house caught on fire, it wouldn't burn up. So you need to have a little safe or something, a storm room, something that won't burn if your house burns. Uh, don't carry it on your person. I mean, if you have a thousand or two on you, that's probably not a wise thing to do. And you say, a thousand or two? I couldn't come up with that. Well, whatever it is, everybody's different. Have some cash on hand so that if the banks are not open, you're not caught flat-footed, that you're able to function in society uh, until things kind of settle themselves again. Just practical things like that. Work toward getting out of debt if you can, especially the high interest debt, that, that revolving debt. Try to, that's true all the time. We ought to get out of that. But work on getting out of that. Do these kinds of things. And then I think most of all, just make sure that your own heart worships God before your republic. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to close with this. Um, I've spent a lot of time, and so has Paul. I think I'm speaking for Paul. Traveling, speaking about the Republic, trying to tell people stand up, vote, do all these things. Here's the history. Here's how we came to be. Though I never meant to, 
and I don't think I quite got there. I may be slightly guilty, though, of putting more devotion into the Republic than sometimes I have the Lord of the Republic. And sometimes I've kind of counted more on us doing the right thing and saving our Republic than I did in looking to God to be my ultimate Savior and my ultimate source. We're all in this room very patriotic Americans, every one of us. You probably wouldn't come to this church if you weren't. But there's a real danger. Remember the devil, if he can't get us off into error, he'll just get us off into excess. All he wants to do, thank you, Miss Lucy, is to divert us. I know lots of preachers who seem to love the ministry more than they do the Lord of the ministry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many preachers would never have an affair on their wives, but their mistress is their church. And they've cheated their wives and their families by their over-devotion to the church itself. Not to Jesus, but to the church. So I think we need to check our hearts, me included, and make sure that we're not dismayed and disturbed because we're worried about what it's going to do to us. Maybe we all wanted Trump to be re-elected because it's best for us. Is that why? Not for truth and justice? Oh, well, we won't want all that. We need to get our hearts right, don't we? So could I close in a prayer? And let's pray that. I know this time has flown by. We didn't get to cover probably nearly as much as we I had one should have. Do it. Okay. We'll send out. Okay, we're we're going to be meeting tomorrow with some other pastors yes. that uh, we are very close to and work with for years. We're going to put together an idea list uh, to send out to everybody, including you know good sources of reliable information because we all need information, uh, a, a safe ways where we can yeah. communicate with each other. We know that Facebook and Twitter is going to hinder any efforts by Christians to communicate. So we're going to have a, some very practical things that we'll send out to you. Uh, within the next week but in the meantime I mean well, this is a Red Sea moment it this is. is you know it God is. loves that opportunity he, he loves that opportunity where <laughs> we does. finally said you know we, we as you said we trust God all the time but when it gets to the point where you absolutely are utterly in a hopeless situation but for God that's generally when he steps in that's exactly does right his most miraculous work but I would say let's specifically as you close this brother let's make sure we all remember to be in prayer for Mayor Giuliani I agree. And for Jay Seculo, as I those agree. are the two heads of the president's legal team, be in prayer for the president and his family. I tell you, I don't know how that man has stood for four years. I remember when I ran for the state senate and they were running those commercials on television calling me a tax cheat. Boy, that irritates you when you have people trying to destroy you. Boy, he has been under the gun for five years now. Pray for him and his family. Also, let's pray for the Supreme Court. Amen. We're not supposed to be ruled by a Supreme Court. Nevertheless, in practice, we are in America. Yeah. Now we have six supposedly more conservative yeah. constitutional justices. Let's pray that they yeah. are faithful to uphold the Constitution. Well, let me pray for us. Just be ready to be very frustrated over the next many months if things don't flip. <laughs> Yesterday, there was a pro-Trump rally at the Capitol in Oklahoma City. They were around the country. Did you know that Facebook censored people who were trying to advertise that rally? Mm-hmm. Facebook censored it. Get ready for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. If this doesn't flip, there's going to be more of that. Mm -hmm. Father, we come to you now at the close of this time. We must tell you, Lord, and admit to you that we are troubled, even though you tell us not to be troubled. We're anxious, even though you tell us not to be anxious. Lord, we're fearful, even though you tell us not to be fearful. Lord, we're just human and we know it. So we admit that to you today. Father, it just could be that sometimes, even in our best intentions, we've put our faith in the wrong place. I'm not suggesting that we pull away and we refute what we've been saying over the years because that's not true. But it could be that we looked more to our republic and our history than we did to you. Lord, if we've done that, please help us to get that right. Help us to get our hearts right with you. Now, Lord, in these fleeting moments, I pray for uh, the president's legal team, for Giuliani and Seculo. Lord, I, I lift them to you. God, give them wisdom beyond their abilities. Give them favor with judges and courts. Lord, I also pray that if this um, sting operation is actually what's going on, then you would give all of those with the responsibility to carry it out, the courage and the safety 
to do it. I pray for President Trump and his family. I don't know whether President Trump knows you personally or not, but I know this. He's done things that seem to have had your hand on him. So I pray that you would minister to them. Maybe this moment would draw them to you if they don't know you. And I pray that they would. Lord, I also want to be faithful to pray for our enemies. You told us to do that. And Lord, we do have enemies of the republic now. And right now they're claiming victory. Lord, I don't think Joe Biden and his family know you. I don't think Nancy Pelosi and her family knows you. I don't, I don't think Chuck Schumer and his family knows you. I, all of these people. Lord, I also pray that something would happen in their lives because some of them are not long for this planet. I pray that they would come to know you. You died for them. Lord, I, 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 uh, I completely reject all the despicable things that they do. But at the same time, Jesus, you shed your blood for them just like you did for me. So I pray for them. Now, God, help us to be who and what we ought to be. God, I pray it in Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll have service in 10 minutes.